Welcome, welcome to the Bevy 0.16 release. If you're wandering into this video, then Bevy is a free and open source data-driven game engine built in Rust, and we'll be covering the best new features in 0.16. So let's start off with a bang. Over the last month or two, as a result of increasing no standard support in Bevy crates, I've been developing some Bevy games on the Game Boy Advance and the Playdate. How, you ask? Well, the no standard working group has successfully enabled no standard in the core Bevy crate. Just disable the default features and you're off ready to go. Now, there are significant rendering differences between, say, a desktop Bevy app and a Game Boy Advance, and making Game Boy Advance games isn't really a commercially viable path to success for an indie game dev. But the highlight here is that Bevy is driving no standard adoption for its own crates as well as the crates it relies on, which in turn not only make retro consoles easier to target, but also modern day consoles. Being able to run on a wider range of devices can lead to better support for more modern WASM targets, like no standard WASM32 v1 nut, bare metal, ESP32s, retro game handhelds, and the more modern lockdown environments. It has even become more likely that crates like WGPU will become no standard compatible as well. And with that, it's on to error handling. Observers, systems, commands, and even fallible system parameters like single can all gracefully handle errors now. This means that you can use Bevy's new result type and the question mark operator you're so used to in all your other Rust code. And the new Bevy error type includes high quality backtraces, the option to configure a global error handler to panic or warn, and more. Error handling is a huge feature of this release, but something that might be equally huge is relationships. In 0.15, the parent and child components were kind of special, but this is no longer true. 0.16 brings a generic relationship trait that can be implemented for custom components. Notably, the major implementation that replaced parent-child components is a one-to-many relationship, where the one component is the source of truth. This means you can add relationships to your own components, and when you insert the source of truth component, the other side of the relationship is maintained for you by Bevy. One-to-many relationships are super useful already, but one-to-one, many-to-many, and what we're calling fragmenting relationships are all planned additions as well. And it's hard to talk about relationships without also mentioning immutable components. Relationships are built on top of the new immutable components feature. This isn't immutable as in you can't change the component value ever, but rather immutable in the sense that to change the value of a component on an entity, you have to reinsert it. This is a somewhat subtle but important distinction. This means that when using immutable components, it is guaranteed that on insert and on remove component hooks and observer events will always fire for that component, which in turn, and in contrast to mutating those values, means that immutable components can be used in combination with observers to maintain indices or other invariants. And you can guarantee that you didn't miss any data. And while you can build your own indexes today, there are already experiments building on top of immutable components to provide a built-in indexing component feature. Expect more to come in this area. And with these new relationships, we've got improved spawn and bundle APIs. And I know for a fact that you'll be excited about this item if you've ever built a Bevy application. The next generation scene and UI system is progressing. And in 0.16, we not only have generalized relationships, including adjustments to the previously named parent and child components, which are now child of and children, but this leads us to some brand new spawning APIs for dealing with hierarchies of entities. The children macro leads the pack, greatly boosting the user experience of the common use case of spawning an entity and its children. No more with children or with child, just keep nesting the children macro. And keeping that going with new support for what's being called bundle effects, these are effects which are applied immediately after a bundle is inserted. This means we can have functions that return hierarchies now. Get ready to create your own component library with a function that returns impl bundle that returns a whole hierarchy no more wishing for a new widget abstraction. The children macro, of course, is syntactic sugar for human readable and writable code. It's not magic. The new spawn wrapper variant that the children macro to sugars to is joined by spawn iter and spawn with for extra spawning juice. But remember that children is that new generic relationship, which means that there's a generic form of this macro called related and the corresponding desugaring, just like the children macro for any relationship you defined on your components still exists. And from spawning hierarchies into math, curves are one of my favorite newer features in Bevy. They aren't brand new in 0.16, but I do want easings and other micro interactions for all my animations. Today, you can sample a curve to move a moving platform from one location to another using its transform already. This is possible in 0.15. But what if you've got a dynamic character controller? Suddenly that perfect curve driven animation doesn't apply physical simulations and doesn't impact your character. In 0.16, Bevy Math now contains the ability to use derivatives and second order derivatives of curves. So that transform modifying curve animating platforms from before that operates on position can easily become an avian linear velocity modifying curve 
because velocity is the derivative of position with respect to time. So now you can build a curve based on the start and end positions that you want to move the platform to and make that apply a linear velocity change, creating physical interaction in your game. While there are many applications of derivatives of curves, this physical simulation is right at the top of my own list today. It's also worth shouting out trait tags in the docs. The docs for Bevy now indicate what traits, like component, resource, or relationship, a particular type implements. This is right at the top of the page. No more scrolling to figure out if something is a component, a resource, or a relationship. And also in 0.16, there is now a disabled component, and every query will act as if it has a without disabled filter. This is unless they explicitly mention the disabled component. You might hear this feature called default query filters or entity disabling. And it's basically a way to have some entities be removed from queries without having to despawn or otherwise move them and without having to modify those queries wherever they come from, whether it's your application code or a third party crate or Bevy core. This can be used for anything from disabling entities that are off screen to being combined with entity cloning to create clonable prefabs that won't show up in regular queries. That's right, create a prefab, disable it, and then clone it into your game whenever you need to spawn it. Additionally, the disabled component isn't special. The infrastructure powering this functionality is exposed, allowing users and libraries to define their own disabling components. This can be useful to have multiple distinct notions of disabled, such as hiding networking entities, and like we just talked about, having prefabs. And since I just mentioned entity cloning, in 0.16, entities gain a new clone API. If the components on your entity have a clone implementation, then you can make use of these new cloning APIs to replicate entities. Non-clonable components will be skipped by default, and a number of customizations are also available, such as removing components from the source entity after cloning them onto the target. And immediately, I kind of already want to build some kind of game where you're running around and you leave clones of yourself behind just directly using this cloning feature. And we've talked a lot about ECS and API and UX and hierarchies, but it's time to get into GPU-driven rendering. While there are some flashy rendering features this cycle, like procedural atmospheric scattering, the major breakthrough for 0.16 is the advent of GPU-driven rendering. GPU-driven rendering in this case is when the GPU takes a representation of a scene and essentially works out what to draw on its own. A large number of PRs landed across a number of different new features that all serve to enable moving more work from the CPU to the GPU. So unless your application hooks into the rendering pipeline, upgrading to Bevy 0.16 will automatically enable GPU-driven rendering for your meshes. I am going to refer you to the release notes, which include a great rundown of the specifics of GPU-driven rendering, but it's worth mentioning that GPU-driven rendering is essentially a collection of techniques, including multi-draw indirect, bindless resources, GPU transform culling, a retained render world, and more. I do want to underscore how big of an improvement this work is, along with mentioning that there is more coming down the pipeline. In 0.16, GPU-driven rendering only applies to the 3D pipeline, but this can be extended to other pipelines like 2D, UI, and more as well. And indeed, as you might imagine, there's already work underway to do this. And into something a little bit more flashy, we've got Weasel, or W-E-S-L. If you've worked with Bevy's shaders, you know the flavor of WGSL it uses is enhanced with features like imports. As it turns out, this kind of functionality isn't just useful to Bevy, but actually a quite large ecosystem outside of Bevy and Rust as well. To this end, WESL, pronounced weasel, is an early community-wide effort to extend WGSL with features like imports, conditional compilation, and even package management. It's super notable that this will also lead to better language server support in your editor. As of 0.16, Bevy implements partial support for WESL shaders behind a flag. This is a super exciting effort and has some caveats to it because it's so early, but living on the bleeding edge of graphics technology is something Bevy is familiar with, having just talked about all that GPU-driven rendering. Don't expect Weasel to replace all of your WGSL today, but definitely give it a look if you're writing shaders today and give some feedback to the wonderful people working on both Weasel and Bevy. There's a new shader material weasel example in the Bevy repo to go play with, so definitely go check that out if this is interesting to you. We will definitely be checking this out on the channel, so also subscribe if you want more of that. And from shader languages to shader implementations, this is decals. Decals are incredibly cool for building immersive environments. There are actually two implementations of decals in 0.16, forward decals and clustered decal projectors. Forward decals are an upstreamed version of contact projective decals, which uses the depth buffer to distort a material on a plane to make it look like it conforms to the geometry it intersects. In practice, you kind of make a square or rectangle, you put your material onto it, and then you define how far away it should interact with 
other meshes. I think the most obvious usage of decals here is the graffiti on the walls of the building, but the yellow paint arrow, footsteps, and even the dirt on the bottom of the walls are all forward decals. I chose to make things pretty obvious in this demo, but hopefully you can see how decals can be used to layer on top of very simplistic textures, in this case, just a grayscale gradient for the walls, to build environments that look far more interesting. But that leaves clustered decals, and clustered decals are an even higher quality form of decal that can project a texture onto any surface within its bounds. While still being high quality, they come with significant platform support downsides at the moment, including not currently supporting WebGL2, WebGPU, macOS, or iOS. So if you're not shipping to Mac and you're not shipping to Web, then you're good. Forward decals are great for adding little plops of detail without having to retexture a whole mesh, and cluster decals are a far more flexible version of that, which in turn means that you can make your tiling textures seem less, well, tiling. And from a production textures to what I think of as more of a debug tool, this is retained gizmos. Previously, gizmos had to be reconstructed every frame, but now they can function more like other spawned entities and persist across frames. This leads to much higher performance for gizmos, a 65 to 80 times improvement, but doesn't replace the original method of using gizmos. Both the old immediate APIs and the new retained APIs are available in 0.16 side-by-side. Side. And we've got something really fancy for you here, Procedural Atmospheric Scattering, which is a customizable system for simulating sunsets, sunrises, and a dynamic day-night cycle in real time. Once it's enabled, the default bevy skybox is overlaid with one that updates in real time based on the directional lights in the scene. The default distance fog is also replaced with one that takes into account those directional lights and other atmospheric parameters. Distant objects will fade to blue on a clear day and will be tinged orange and pink at sunset. Also, because the atmosphere is compositive on top of the skybox, creating a nighttime starscape is easy. Just spawn the skybox and it'll naturally fade away as the sky grows brighter at dawn. And in the vein of rendering performance, draw less stuff is a great way to increase performance. And actually, now that I think about it, do less work is always great performance advice. Occlusion culling, then, is the idea that if one object eclipses another, it doesn't need to render. A person standing behind a wall doesn't need to have resources dedicated to rendering it, for example. While Bevy already does depth comparison to remove some of this kind of work, there's an even better approach in 0.16. In 0.16, Bevy supports an experimental version of two-phase occlusion culling that is already used by the experimental virtual geometry features. The reason two-phase occlusion culling is listed as experimental is that there are known precision issues that, while not convincingly being problematic, are worth ironing out before stabilizing the feature. And having mentioned virtual geometry just now, virtual geometry is Bevy's nanite-like rendering system. In 0.16, it received performance improvements from a variety of PRs, and the author posts their own roundup of the feature's progress, so I will leave the rest to that post this cycle. And finally, a rendering feature that I'm super excited about, but that you might miss if skimming the release notes. That is mesh tag. Bevy has powerful support for automatic instancing for any entities that share the same mesh and material. However, Sometimes it can still be useful to reference data that is not the same across all instances of a material. The new mesh tag component allows adding a custom U32 to mesh material entities that can be referenced in the vertex shader for a material. You can use this in combination with storage textures or buffers for extra, extra data in your shaders. I actually already use a user land version of this in the outline shader I wrote for this game, where the mesh texture data is squashed to a zero to one range per mesh and then added to the mesh tag to create a separation between objects, even if the texture indicates similar values. So obviously I'm very excited about this feature and will be porting my code to use it. And that's it for the Bevy release this time around. I've got more 0.16 videos lined up this week. So if you've watched this far, leave a bird emoji in the comments and let me know if there's anything you're interested in hearing more about. Until next time, have a great rest of your week.